Welcome to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the health cloud company. We're on a mission to connect and curate the world's healthcare information to make it accessible and useful. With Innovacer, everyone works in the service of patients like never before as one. Visit us online at innovacer.com. Well, welcome back to the Innovation Accelerator podcast. I'm Dr. Anil Jain, Chief Innovation Officer here at Innovacer. Today, we'll be sharing an engaging conversation with Marianne Yeager, Chief Executive Officer of the Sequoia Project. Founded in 2012, the Sequoia Project is an independent, trusted advocate for nationwide health information exchange. It has worked in coordination with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, or ONC, in the capacity of maintaining the nationwide e-health exchange. Most recently, the organization was named the Regional Coordinating Entity, or the RCE, by the ONC to manage major components of the Emerging Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, or TEFCA, finalized earlier this year. Marianne, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me and share your experiences and expertise with our audience. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Jane. It's ha- I'm happy to be here. Now, before we get started, please share a little bit about your current role and focus, as well as how you got to the point where you're at now in terms of your career. Well, I've had the honor and pleasure of serving as the CEO for the Sequoia Project since its inception, and we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. And really, my role has been shepherding our journey towards interoperability. We started with very humble beginnings and being a steward for an initiative and, and spun that out, and we're able to expand our focus um, in that regard. And Really, I've been focused on health IT literally my entire career. I will not divulge how long that's been. I don't want to give away my age there, but um, it's really been you know just an incredible pleasure to um, really serve in this role. And I think the main theme that I've seen throughout my career is really you know serving as a bridge between policy and technical and getting people with differing views to agree and building consensus, and that's really served as well. You know, particularly in my role here at Sequoia. Well, well, thanks for that. And I congratulations on your 10 year anniversary. Um, that's such an incredibly important topic. Uh, I've been involved with interoperability and uh, it's no easy task to get consensus uh, in this particular area. Well, let's, let's talk about interoperability for a moment. The term interoperability is so widely used in the healthcare sector. And as an industry, we've been at it for some time, even in my short career in, as a clinician uh, in the earliest days of rolling out an EMR, um, we've been tossing around that concept for, for a bit. So maybe you can start us off. Tell us what you mean by interoperability. What's your definition of interoperability? And how will we ever know when we've arrived? Well, again, it's a journey. Um, so when we, when I think about interoperability, what, what we mean here at Sequoia is the ability for two systems to interconnect and share information and it, for it to have the same meaning from the sending system and the recipient system. And when you look at it, they're really different levels. So there's the ability to move the data. So there's the transport and then there's the structure of the data itself. And so that, again, the setting and receiving systems can, um, you know, process that the same way. The hardest part is the semantics or the codifying the data um, in a way so that they're consistent vocabulary. So it has the same meaning between um, the sending system and the receiving system. And so um, it, it is challenging to get there. I think we've made a lot of progress and certainly in the transport and the structural side. And now we're really trying to double down and, and focus on semantics as well. Well, uh, speaking of progress, um, back in on January 18th of this year, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services um, at the ONC announced the publication of the final rule for the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. Tell us a little bit more. Give us a high-level understanding for those of our audience who haven't heard that term or want to learn more about it. What, what, does, what is TEFCA? And, and in terms of what its purpose is, who are the stakeholders? And how are we, are we going to operationalize something which I think is going to be an accelerant for interoperability? Well, we certainly hope so. So, you know, in healthcare, we have to have our acronyms and, and TEFCA is no exception. So back in December of 2016, Congress passed the 21st Century Cures Act and it had a number of different components of it to accelerate clinical research and bring new treatments to market. And and there was also an important section related to interoperability. And um, Congress basically directed the ONC to develop or support a trusted exchange framework and common agreement or TEFCA that would make it easier and basically be a a government-endorsed approach for networks to interconnect and exchange with each other. Not unlike 
you know, you know how you sort of see the seamless exchange of um, ACH and ATM transactions and financial services. So that was sort of the aim. The idea was to enable ONC to um, bring together stakeholders and work with the private sector organization to really help them develop, develop the components that would enable this. And so um, the idea is that TEFCO will uh, provide a government endorsed approach for networks that want to be designated as TEFCA qualified health information networks, um, and that they, by signing the agreement and abiding by the rules of the road, would have the special government designated status. What that means is that a healthcare organization or a payer, public health agency that connects to a QHIN has an assurance that they will be able to connect to everyone else in this network of networks without having to go through a lot of special effort. Well, it sounds like what TEFCA brings is a lot of components that uh, facilitate trust, which is an important part of, of exchange. Um, I served on the Federal Health IT Advisory Committee for about three years and uh, was on one of the subcommittees for TEFCA. And it's amazing to see that it's actually now taking shape. So what are the aspects of TEFCA that um, the Sequoia Project will be managing or overseeing um, as the regional coordinating entity? And, and how should we be thinking about the Sequoia Project's role um, in, in TEFCA? Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, for sure. So ONC um, began work on TEFCA back in t 2017, and they had the ability, so they started working on components of it and the policy parameters and starting putting together contractual provisions. They also had the ability to work with and select a private sector organization to serve as the recognized coordinating entity, RCE. We were really, really honored to have been selected as to serve in that role. And we got, um, and we received that designation back in August of 2019. And since then, we hit the ground running. I mean, really, as you mentioned, Dr. Jane, it really is about trust. And so we spend um, a lot of time uh, listening to stakeholders and enlisting feedback and working with the ONC to develop uh, a set of contract terms in the common agreement that really embodies what you would need to have trusted exchange in a government endorsed approach. So we uh, were able to publish uh, um, the first version of the common agreement and the technical implementation guide called the Qualified Health Information Network Technical Framework or QTF. And we published those in January of this year. And those are the first versions made available for um, for use. And so we're continuing to uh, you know um, develop the other components to support that as well. I, I think it's an incredible task to create these implementation guides and give folks a head start on how to get these agreements in place and how to technically start to exchange data. But when you look at TEFCA and the final rules, it appears to be a voluntary program. Uh, and, and many things in healthcare, and I've been practicing long enough and, and doing informatics long enough to know that some things that are voluntary today may be less voluntary in the future. So give us a sense of where the program being voluntary, how is that going to promote interoperability, uh, at least in a meaningful way, um, when it's not a mandatory program? How does that, how does that work? Well, you know, this is really, uh, um, really channeling our role at Sequoia and everything that we've done did not come with it a governmental mandate, but we were able to really get traction and success by providing value. And that's where we see TEFCA falling as well is that, um, that in order for TEFCA to be successful, inherently, it needs to provide value. What that means, it needs to be easier to access information. It should support a multitude and range of purposes. Um, it should make it simpler than what we have today. And it should also help move the market in a way that we haven't been able to do in the private sector. So, you know, do we need a mandate necessarily for TEFCA to be successful? Probably not. If we're really striking the right balance of value and making it easier and providing, um, you know, other and a way for other actors in the space to engage in information exchange who haven't been, that will really speak volumes. Now, when, when folks ask you, what are the pitfalls or the disadvantages of not doing uh, not participating in, in TEFCA, what, how do you respond? Well, you know, really, there's a role for everyone to participate in TEFCA. Um, there, it really is not intended to supplant or replace the current networks in which they participate. And so we're hoping that it's an easy entry point that it will just make sense to naturally participate. Do we anticipate that every single healthcare organization in the U.S. will participate in TEFCA? Well, you know, we hope they do. Um, but the, um, the challenge will be for them is that they're going to start missing out. Um, they're not going to have the ability to access the type of information that others will be able to. 
Um, when we expand Tefka to support payment and healthcare operations, it's going to make it so much easier to uh, provide information or access information for those purposes. We think there'll be a real return on investment with that. So that's another advantage. And then importantly, we're really hoping that Tefka will serve as a backbone to support public health and to make it easier to respond to um, emergencies in the future. And so I think at some point, you know, you will we'll have the early adopters that get involved, we'll do the rollout, and then hopefully we'll get, you know, reach that last mile for those who maybe, you know, want to wait and, and join later. Well, that's a great segue to the next question. You know, w- one of the things, and I'm a primary care doc when I used to practice um, m- much more than I do now, but, but across the country, when you look at how patient care is delivered out in the communities, it's somewhat fragmented. Um, they often will have multiple providers in different settings, and they may visit hospitals and get their labs done in, across town. When you start thinking about bringing all that information together to create a, a single view of that patient, um, the way that one might think about, uh, you mentioned the financial sector with ATM machines, we sort of take that for granted, that we have the ability to do that. When you start to bring in the information to create a single longitudinal view of an individual, um, it, it's clear that interoperability is, is paramount to do that. Do you see the work that the Sequoia Project is doing through initiatives like TEFCA and others as paramount to helping organizations, whether they're healthcare organizations or, or organizations that they partner with, in creating that single view that brings together their clinical, their administrative claims, their social determinants of health? How do you see the role of the Sequoia Project in fulfilling that perhaps utopian view of a single view of an individual? Well, I don't know that we can say that we, uh, you know, um, that the single view of the individual is the only goal, but interoperability is really the underpinning for what we really need as a country to improve health and welfare and population health and to have, you know, more timely access to information to make informed decisions and you know, what we do every day at Sequoia, we have the unique ability to just focus on this one issue and advancing interoperability for the public good. We do that through our initiatives day to day. And certainly TEFCA, you know, is has a similar aim. I mean, our hope and our goal and what we measure our success in each and every day is are we making it easier for information to be exchanged, whether it's clinical information, information needed for operational purposes, broadening that um, further to include social determinants, bringing in a b- the ability to connect to community service providers, you know, expanding to um, enable connectivity w- between providers and payers. And, and when I say that, we know that there are some capabilities today that are largely point to point, but what we're trying to do is to have a more standardized approach. So you sort of participate in this nationwide network of networks and you have that connection point to support a multitude of purposes, multitude of different data types. So you don't have to create a specialty purpose network every time you have a data need. And we saw that with the pandemic. If we had had TEFCA and this nationwide network of networks that public health agencies were connected to, we would have probably had a, a more effective response. And so, you know, we sort of look at our ability to impact that and, and the progress really through that lens. And that is very expansive, whether it is you know, supporting the creation of a longitudinal record or making, you know, sure public health agencies have access to the information for case reporting or, um, you know, and other, you know, public health reporting purposes and pandemic response. Marianne, last week, the Sequoia Project released additional details regarding the requirements and process for becoming a QHIN, as well as standard operating uh, procedures. Can you clarify more about this release and why it's so important for healthcare organizations to be paying attention to this news? Well, sure. Well, a lot of the information that we published was actually geared toward organizations that want to become qualified health information networks. And so a lot of the details are really pertinent to them. But what this signals is that we're getting ready to launch this program and open up the application process and begin onboarding and designating QHINs, which means we're that step much closer to actually having an operational ecosystem. So I think that um, what they should pay attention to are there are going to be additional resources forthcoming that would apply to healthcare organizations that would participate in a QHIN. For instance, we'll be publishing a model flowdown agreement. That would be the type of terms that they would have to agree to, to opt into connecting to a QHIN. And there are also going to be some expectations around security, for instance. I think, again, what this means um, is that, you know, we have a definitive plan that we're moving forward. When we also published 
draft was a timeline for when the additional artifacts will be published and released. And this is not just aspirational. This is an actual work plan that we're working towards. And so we are, again, marching toward that launch date um, with later this summer, early fall. That's fantastic. Now, I know it's probably a early since the news um, release was just some time ago. What has been the level of interest? Are you guys um, seeing what you were expecting to see? You know, I think we're seeing a little bit more than we were expecting to see, but there's been a high level of interest really um, over the past two years there. We're increasingly seeing groups make public announcements about their intentions become QHINs. We've received inquiries from groups we've never really heard from before. So I think there's a healthy interest right now, though, since the details were really just um, revealed in terms of the QHIN onboarding and application process, the eligibility criteria, there's a lot of detail and a lot of rigor and vetting that we will do. And so right now they really have the information they can start making, you know, a formed, an informed assessment. Do they have the characteristics and traits and attributes to be a QHIN? Does it fit with their business model? Is this something they're suited to do? And so they're going to be making some strategic decisions around that. Now, when you start to think about the widespread adoption of TEFCA, when we look at the different sorts of problems that it may solve for provider organizations, for healthcare organizations in general. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, public health. You mentioned, you know, what would it look like if we had something like this in a pre-pandemic? But now as we go into recovery in the post-pandemic world, what are some additional areas in which provider organizations can expect to be, um, to be different in a post-TEFCA world, if you will? Well, post Tefka, once we're fully rolled out, we'll have the ability for providers to be able to access and share information for payment purposes and for healthcare operational purposes. And to date, most of the information being exchanged, particularly through national networks and frameworks in the private sector like Carry Quality, is largely around treatment. And that's provider to provider. So what we're going to see is the ability for healthcare organizations to have access to different um, exchange partners and for a much broader set of purposes than they might have today. Public health is a good example. You know, we know that there are a lot of, you know, um, proprietary ways or different ways that, you know, doing public health reporting. Um, but, you know, what we heard, particularly through the pandemic, is there were a lot of one-off requests um, from different public health agencies that maybe this will provide a more streamlined approach to have a, a standardized way of communicating with public health agencies rather than doing these sort of one-off requests. In addition, um, there will be the ability for individuals, we haven't really talked about this yet, but to have the ability to access their own health information so they can use an app or platform of their choice They can that taps in and connects uh, via QHIN for TEFCA, and then that is the ability for that individual to access their own health information in a way that's fairly unprecedented. And, and do you think the American public is ready to have access to their medical record through this? Well, you know, that's a great question. And that's something where we are actually in Sequoia, um, separate from our work as a recognized coordinating entity, have formed a consumer engagement work group. Um, this includes representatives from all walks of life. These are actual consumers. They're not health IT insiders. We really want to uncover and unpack what sort of challenges are there? Um, how do we assure that consumers understand their right to access? Do they understand the health information? Do they understand how their information could be used or disclosed? And that, as well as how can that, that be a, a platform or a way for them to be more engaged in, in their own health? So I think there's a lot of unknowns here. I think we there's a lot more education awareness that needs to take place. But what TEFCA is, is an enabler and also of leveling the playing field. So knowing that whatever platform someone chooses, if they're participating through TEFCA, you can have assurance that that platform, that service provider is going to be subject to HIPAA, just like any other actor where today under existing law, they're kind of not addressed. And so that's where TEFCA was really able to bridge some gaps and, you know, make inroads in a way that we haven't been able to to date. So when we think about the ability for TEFCA to bring all this information together, one of the keen areas of, of interest would be, can we use the, uh, the information that's been brought together to help improve the efficiency in the way healthcare is delivered by reducing unnecessary procedures, um, information that has been siloed all of a sudden is now together, and perhaps decision-making, uh, diagnostic decision-making, treatment decisions can be more efficient. 
Absolutely. Um, interoperability is an enabler uh, so that there should inherently be more efficiencies by not having to complete uh, redundant labs or tests, etc. By having information that's accessible, you, you can rely on and have at your fingertips information that is, you know, as you have mentioned, is formally siloed and it sort of opens it up. When, um, when I was on the Federal uh, Health IT Advisory Committee, one of the key themes throughout the three years that I, I sat on the committee was the goal to create open architecture using open standards. Tell me a little bit more about um, how the ONC will be sort of focusing on the adoption of these open standards and uh, things like the FAST uh, healthcare um, interoperability resources and TEFCA. How will those come together to start to create a much more expansive way of innovating um, in, in healthcare, especially around interoperability? For sure. Well, you know, standards are the underpinning, open standards are the underpinning of the QHEN technical framework, including the first version that was published, which was based on um, existing document-based exchange uh, protocols, etc. And we also, um, in conjunction with publishing the first version of the Common Agreement in QTF earlier this year, also published the FIRE Roadmap. And that really puts forward the steps in which we're going to, in the timeframes in which we're going to start putting out um, and opens, you know, you know, basically the specification based on the open standards and, you know, having a process for rolling that out. So that's um, what we're planning to do is have the first version, a draft of the FIRE implementation guide that we'll release this summer, hopefully, and uh, we'll get public input on that, stakeholder feedback. And then we're looking to actually pilot it and then make it available and adopt it for implementation on TEFCA in 2023. One of the questions I often get, and, and I'll ask you this question, is, well, if everything is an open architecture and everything is open standards, how do companies like Innovacer and others who are in the innovation space, how do we actually innovate if everyone is using the same standards? Any thoughts on, on what FIRE means to those who want to innovate? Is it well, an accelerant? Sure. Is it a deterrent? Is it, it just is what it is? The whole idea of TEFCA is to commoditize the movement of data so that the innovation can occur at the edges. The innovation is going to take place with the services that um, organizations provide and the analytics and what you're able to do with the data. And so really TEFCA is, is an enabler of innovation to um, instead of having to invest so much time, energy and resources just to get data that by um, really liberating it through this, you know, as a more commodity based capability will actually stimulate and promote innovation, I believe, in a way that we haven't seen to date. We talked a little bit about providers and how they would get benefit from having a TEFCA-enabled world um, where, well, I wouldn't say world, a TEFCA-enabled U.S. healthcare system, if you will. Um, what about payers? Uh, you know, there are significant mandates for payers to be able to provide the, uh, a, a longitudinal record of the claims data when patients or members of a health plan shift uh, plans and, and so on. So how does TEFCA relate to the payer mandates uh, that they, the challenges that they might be facing in order to comply with what all consumers want, which is they would want their plans to have a complete record of their medical care? Well, TEFCA, again, is an enabler um, in, in viewing um, payers as one of the actors in, in a TEFCA ecosystem would make it easier for payers to exchange information payer to payer between payer and provider and also to individuals. And again, it's um, payers to date in terms of um, interoperability and national networks. Uh, haven't largely been present yet because the use cases and capabilities that they're looking for haven't been largely supported. So this is a way, again, in which with the government's backing can really move the market in a way to bring other actors who haven't been part of national networks, for instance, into the fold and to participate in TEFCA. One of the things that I'm uh, struck by, uh, and in my role, um, I often will chat with folks who are working in small practices and bigger practices. Um, and you know, fortunately, in my practice, um, when I did practice, it was much more in a large integrated delivery system. But we have a number of providers still out there on paper. And we even have some providers who are using fax machines. Um, in the Internet age, they're using fax machines. So and, and, and we know that a vast majority of Americans um, still see multiple clinicians, as we mentioned earlier, across the community. And they're going to be running into these clinicians, some who may be fantastic fantastic uh, clinicians. 
Uh, how do you envision the focus on interoperability standards, especially the way that um, TEFCA is being rolled out as a catalyst to start moving some of those clinicians away from paper and fax machines onto, um, for lack of a better phrase, into more modern ways of exchanging information that we know consumers uh, want? Well, you know, it's a great question, and it's not just clinicians that are not really participating in a digitized uh, environment, but also long-term post-acute care and, and other care settings that have not largely been digitized. I mean, TEFCA could be a pull and a draw. Um, again, it, it's about solving practical, valuable workflow issues, and we're definitely, um, particularly long-term post-acute care, mental health, substance abuse, is really high on our radar. And so it's going to be part of a, a, a long journey, and you know we're hoping, again, to reach that last mile of those who may not be uh, fully participating, but there definitely are some um, important goals that we have to make it easier um, to, and again, it, it boils down to value. Can we replace a paper or a manual workflow with something that is more streamlined and automated and then, um, you know, really to stimulate that uh, participation? When we think about uh, even my family members, I'll get calls periodically um, about various digital health, health apps that they can download from the App Store or from the Google Play Store or whatever it might be. And I envision that the digital health apps that are out there there's going to be, as you kind of alluded to earlier, a desire to bring all of that, that information together. This growing consumerism, the idea that uh, patients are going to be able to bring their medical record into an app, perhaps a disease-specific app, perhaps a health and wellness app, uh, and, and, and have access to that data. What, what is the, the sort of the, the, the time horizon? How does it work when we start to see non-EMR, non-payer claims, non-traditional sources of data being brought forward to create an interoperable uh, healthcare ecosystem. Any thoughts, uh, any predictions as to which way we'll be heading or how we will get there where it can be just as easy to bring the, the EKG being done by the Apple Watch or the, the number of steps I've taken that's being generated by a Fitbit? How, how do we bring that into the record? And how do we uh, how do we create some sensibility around how that's going to appear for the clinicians when they start to see reams and reams of data that they might have to go through? Well, you know, that's a great question. I don't know that I have any predictions. I tend to be very practically oriented in terms of what you know we can really realize and achieve to date. I think it's a baby step as well as a giant leap just to get the ability for us as individuals to access our own health records. Uh, being able to contribute data from all these different sources is probably the next phase of that. And we have some work we need to do to um, really achieve that vision of, of enabling individuals to access their own health information. Believe it or not, the technical capabilities have existed for quite a long time. And there just really hasn't been an impetus to to turn that on. And so participating in TEFCA, if you're participating in TEFCA, you have to respond to an individual's request for their own record. And frankly, you have to respond and provide a copy of the information unless you're prohibited by law from doing so. Um, so it's, it's a really different mark. Uh, it's a different target. I think if we can get some traction and momentum there, it will sort of open it up to then do that reverse view of how do we take information from all these other devices and, you know, internet of things and, and bring it back into the clinical workflow. Well, I think I think it's great to see that you guys have convened a, a group of of sort of people at large, if you will, uh, consumers um, who are going to help figure out what is the right balance. Um, and I just hope the clinical community balances it out with with making sure that we're we're not being put in a position of having to to deal with a onslaught of data that really, frankly, no one would know what to do with. Uh, but but that's great. Now, are are you thinking through the 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 ideas around? Um, the ability for consumers um, to be able to understand the data that they're looking at through sort of what I would call the digital health literacy and the ability to make sure that we don't further create um, inequity uh, through digital divide, for example, through like sort of almost like a digital health equity. Is that part of this group's mandate and, and how you, you're all thinking about this? I would say that's certainly in scope, but since this group is just forming, we're really starting around uh, with their right to access and really 
understanding what gaps and challenges exist and ways to make it easier. Not too far from that is, you know, what is the, what do the data mean? And are they going to be able to understand it? And I mean, all these issues are really interrelated. Um, it's our first foray in engaging a group of, of consumers who truly are not health IT insiders. We've tended to look at big, big policy issues and looking at nationwide approaches and now talking to people from all walks of life all different kinds of backgrounds and across different regions of the country is going to really be very eye-opening. I think we're humbly admitting that we have a lot to learn and to um, inform this journey. And it's an and it's an exciting opportunity. And we're hoping to work with other groups as well that are working on this. We heard from a number of different um, groups that this is an area of great import and, and we'd like to partner and, and collaborate in, in any way we can. So, Marianne, what else is the Sequoia Project working on now? Um, you mentioned a lot of really good work. Um, and and as you tell us what you guys are working on now, maybe you can preview a little bit about what you guys are going to work on next and, and perhaps also tell our audience, for those who are interested in getting involved, uh, are there opportunities to get involved, um, committees, work groups, and things of that sort that you might want to share with the audience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we really, our work is really, um, led by a leadership council. They actually help us identify and prioritize what we work on. It's a group called Interoperability Matters. That's the program. And that's really, aside from the RCE business, that's really our, our really core area of focus. Um, we have a number of efforts underway, uh, one of which is Emergency Preparedness Information Workgroup. They are looking at and wrote a white paper based upon lessons learned and came up with 17 recommendations. This group is just incredible. It includes representatives from CMS, HHS, ASPR, CDC, uh, state public health agencies, HIEs, you know, other private sector organizations. And so they're really, you know, following those recommendations, really starting to unpack where we could as a follow on um, pursue next. Data usability is a huge focus area for us. We knew that we were making uh, headway with interoperability and at least enabling the exchange of records when clinicians started screaming that this data, these data are horrible, they're not useful. And so we know that there needs to be more work and not just a one time thing, but a longer term endeavor to improve the semantics and the usability of the data. And that's co chaired by two really incredible uh, clinicians um, and looking at it from the end user perspective. So there's a great balance that group is open to the public, anybody can participate, we'll have the first version of that implementation guide published this August, we hope. And then again, it's not just about publishing an implementation guide, we want to work with the implementation community to implement it. The other area of focus is information blocking compliance. So if you're not blocking the exchange of information, then you're sharing. And it really dovetails to a lot of the issues that we spend our day thinking about, policy issues and uh, technical matters and other things. And so that group has been working for three years. We're going to be releasing two resources on that. Um, that we'll make available to the public. One is on the definition of electronic health information as it relates to a designated record set and the other good practices by actor types. So if you're you know, a health information network or a healthcare provider um, and, and the like or a health plan, you know, you're know you subject to some of these rules. And so you know, we're really trying to create a community of practice around that. Um, and then stakeholder engagement in the consumer work group I mentioned are importantly um, focused. In terms of what, what's next, We'll be turning to our community and asking them where where are the biggest challenges where we could play a role. We are hearing more that maybe we should uh, begin working on our pa next version of our patient matching work. We're again identifying the ways that we can improve patient matching with existing technologies today, and there are things that we can do. So really, very open to other um, opportunities as well. If you want to get involved, go to our uh, sequoiaproject.org. Um, go to Interoperability Matters, get involved, sign up for our listserv. We'd love to have more people at the table and helping us work on these important issues. I, I will certainly be following the progress of the Sequoia Project. Uh, I know some members of my co my colleagues within the company will be following the work on the patient matching. That's a, that's a keen area of, of interest, and uh, we've got some unique challenges in the U.S. around that. Well, Marianne, it has been terrific speaking with you about such a topic that we're both passionate about, and it's clear um, that the Sequoia Project is doing some pretty amazing work uh, now, and you've got a full slate coming up. Um, I hope our, our audience does get involved. Uh, I know that I'll be tracking some of these uh, initiatives very carefully, and I hope we have a chance to have you come back and tell us about some of the progress we're making uh, as an industry around interoperability 
uh, I know that um, the audience will be very eager to hear ab about that. So um, thank you again for participating. And um, let's definitely do this again very soon. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Now, our thanks to Marianne Yeager, CEO of the Sequoia Project, who spoke with us about TEFCA and about interoperability and how we achieve a meaningful level of interoperability in the U.S. Now, for our listeners, don't forget to check the show notes for links to resources, including the links that Marianne provided and contact information related to today's show. Stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more shows covering the healthcare IT topics that you care about. For more information on this and other healthcare IT topics, please visit uh, innovacer.com. That's I-N-N-O-V-A-C-C-E-R.com. I'm Dr. Anil Jain. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You've been listening to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the health cloud company. Don't forget to check the show notes for links to related resources and other information. And stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more programs about the healthcare IT topics you care about. Accelerate your transformation and build the future of health on the Innovacer Health Cloud. For more information, please visit innovacer.com.